Uh, good morning, everybody. It's eight o'clock uh, Sunday morning. Thank you for joining. And uh, uh, what I felt was uh, because of the uh, COVID and the fact that uh, fellows uh, start in July, I, I designed these uh, uh, six classes to help uh, uh, fellows with their learning, especially the introduction. And uh, today I have the distinct uh, a pleasure of uh, having my colleague, Dr. Selvi Tirumoti, uh, who is the program director uh, for education at MD Anderson Cancer Center. My good friend for a long time, uh, Dr. Roy Sitikna, uh, who is the master endoscopist at, uh, uh, from the ASGE. He is the one who actually taught us about flat lesions in this country, and he's also passionate about education on the web actually how to do virtual training for trainees. You know, you'll be uh, blown away by what he's doing in terms of his current uh, research. And uh, my uh, fellow, Zubair Khan, uh, Zubair has been very helpful in giving me feedback on how to really do these sessions and modify. And I'm uh, really grateful to uh, Yuki, uh, Mr. Yuki Nakajima, uh, who is an engineer and who has worked with uh, uh, endoscopy uh, uh, companies uh, for a very long time. And uh, I requested him to uh, be a panelist and provide some insights uh, to help us. And uh, the way it's going to work out is uh, uh, we will have, uh, I would like you to uh, mute yourself and I'm going to present uh, the uh, story uh, as I want to present it. And then at the end, we will have a panel discussion. Okay, this is one of the problems. By accident, I think I <laughs> unmuted myself. <laughs> so, so, and I want to thank uh, Angela Deal, who is a medical illustrator. And uh, I've been working with Angela for quite some time. And uh, she has drawn all the diagrams that you will see in this uh, lecture. And uh, Sure uh, Sanjay Suresh, who is uh, an educator, uh, planning to go to medical school, uh, and uh, Sanjay is helping in the development of endoscopy tech training program at the community college. Uh, we're going to start that in uh, spring of 2021. Right. So at the outset, I would like to dedicate this session to the engineers that make uh, uh, the endoscopy uh, equipment and all the accessories that allow us to do uh, what we do. And uh, I'm really grateful to them. I'm sure we all should be grateful to them. And these are the people who actually uh, work long hours uh, to uh, make the perfect instrument and they keep on uh, trying to perfect uh, whatever they've done before. And at the outset, I would like to take a little bit of time and I want to go through this uh, 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 issue uh, that was published in uh, Video GIE. Uh, Video GIE is uh, an official journal of uh, ASGE and we publish Meet the Master series. And I would like uh, the fellows to go and read Meet the Master series. And I would like to talk about Mr. Hiroshi Ichikawa. He is the first uh, uh, industry uh, person. Actually, he is an engineer uh, who was honored by ASGE at the Crystal Awards uh, 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 in, uh, uh, at the DDW uh, last year. And uh, he was given the uh, a special honor of recognition. And if you want to know, you know what were his contributions, uh, he has done work uh, for Olympus uh, for over 50 years. And as you can see here, uh, he, he was a young engineer from Tokyo. He's a mechanical engineer. And uh, he was uh, uh, deployed by uh, Olympus to United States to introduce endoscopy equipment. And uh, if you look at it right now, we have probably the best of the best endoscopes right now. But this is a gastro camera. Uh, this is one of the original instruments that was built in 1960s. It, and at the tip, 
uh, there was a camera and a light. And uh, they used to push this uh, camera into the stomach. Uh, they couldn't see much and they took a series of uh, pictures. So from that, you can see what we have currently. And what was his major contribution uh, is he worked with uh, Dr. Hiromi Shinya, Hiromi Shinya uh, in New York and developed the polypectomy snare. You know, if there's one device that has revolutionized endoscopy, uh, that is polypectomy snare. And if you look at polypectomy snare, you can actually prevent a lot of cancer, uh, especially colon cancer. And uh, he and uh, Dr. Shinya came up with the design. That design has not changed in the last uh, 40 years. And, uh, and then you, you'll know how robust his design was. And then he, he went from center to center, uh, uh, working with uh, leading experts. And uh, he introduced uh, all the scopes, you know, whether you think about the upper GI scope, colonoscope, ERCP scope to the United States. And that is a lot of work for any one person to do in, in a lifetime, you know, and uh, he was, uh, uh, he had that uh, personality to interact with people. And uh, I had the uh, privilege of meeting him while I was at UTMB Galveston uh, when he visited uh, our center. And uh, here is uh, Jack Venice at the, you know, at the Minneapolis uh, VA. Uh, he is one of the pioneers in ERCP. In addition to that, he was responsible for developing uh, training programs uh, in the United States working with the American Society for uh, GI Endoscopy. On a personal level, uh, he was a, a painter and uh, you, can, you could see that painting. And uh, I would like to encourage you all to listen to this interview Dr. Jerry Way did uh, to honor him for the Meet the Master series. And this video is available on the YouTube. So I just want to pay my respects to uh, Mr. Hichikawa for all his contributions. So coming to the objectives, uh, we're going to talk about uh, parts of the scope, a little more about the insertion tube, uh, control section, umbilical cord, and uh, uh, the different uh, aspects that we need to think about when you're handling the scope. So I feel that this is one of the most beautifully designed instrument that you can think of in the medical industry. Uh, this design has been there for almost uh, 50 years. And uh, basically the basic design has not changed. And uh, that tells about how the engineers have thought through this whole idea. And uh, let's talk about the different parts of the scope. The, basically, there are three parts. As you can see, there are three parts. And what are the three parts? We'll go into a little more detail. So you have the control section, and that is the one that actually helps you to uh, illuminate, uh, take photos, put in air, suction fluid, turn right, turn left, and uh, able to control everything. So that is the control section that you hold it in your left hand. And then you have the umbilical card that goes into a processor. And uh, the processor uh, will do some more functions and the umbilical card insertion, this section has several different connections that we're going to talk about. And then you have the insertion tube. And this is the tube that goes into uh, the body. And depending upon what you're planning to do, the tube can be of different lengths, different uh, diameters, and uh, different functions at the end that we're going to talk about. So let us talk about what is in, inside the insertion tube. That's the most important thing. It's a fascinating construction. And what is inside an insertion tube? So you have a, a container, that's the wall, 
and the wall has several layers. And the way they designed it makes it very useful for us to make small adjustments, like you rotate your, uh, like you rotate your uh, uh, pen in the hand, and that movement can be uh, transmitted all the way to the tip of the endoscope. And if you want to see how they have done, you have several layers. You have an outer layer uh, that is uh, made of a special polymer uh, top coat that sits on a base layer and that uh, is covering a stainless steel or a metal uh, wire mesh. And then inside you have two different spiral bands, an outer one and an inner one. It's almost like the way the gut has, right? In a, a circular muscle, longitudinal muscle, you can think about how the gut functions. The scope also has several layers and these different components allow you to transmit whatever you're doing in your uh, hand. If you rotate a little bit, it will rotate a little bit. But you need to know how to handle the insertion tube to really get that function. So what is inside the uh, insertion tube? What are the contents? And uh, there are several components. And if you think about the components that are there, So there are several different components, okay? Let's look at uh, two things. You, when you put the light on, the light needs to go there. You have light guide fiber. And then when you take a photo, you need a camera. So you have a CCD signal wire. There are two different things uh, for uh, taking the photographs. And then you have channels, a channel for uh, taking biopsies or suction, a channel for putting in air, and a channel for cleaning your lens, or, and then a channel for water jet. So these are the different channels that are inside the scope. And then you look at it and say to yourself, how do I turn my scope? Left, right, up, down. So there are what are called angulation wires. These angulation wires actually help to move, the, to move the tip of the scope either left, right, up, or down. And then uh, the colonoscope, especially made by Olympus, has another function that it is it gives the adjustable stiffness. And when, you, when, we, when we talk about this, I'm going to talk about this, what this adjustable stiffness is. So there, there are several different components at the tip of the scope. So let us look at how the tip of the scope looks like, uh, because that's the most important part of the endoscope. And as you can see here, this is the tip of the scope and we have a section. You have an air water nozzle that actually cleans the lens. And you have a biopsy channel here uh, that uh, allows you to take biopsies, flush water or suction water or suction the contents. And then you have a water jet that allows you to uh, clean the contents of the lumen. And then you have the objective lens. And then you have the light guide. So as you can see, there are several different components. For the sake of fellows, when you hold a scope, make sure that you hold the tip of the scope in your hand. And if you don't do that, and you're holding the scope like this, and you bang the tip of the scope, you know how much it's going to cost? It's going to cost between ten twenty thousand dollars of repairs, depending upon how much damage you cause to the tip of the scope, where you damage the CCD chip, or the light guide, or the channels. So you want to make sure when you hold the scope, you make sure you hold the tip of the scope. That's the most important thing. So I hope you got the message there. So next, let us talk about the control section. 
the control section, right? So this is what is uh, this is what you're going to hold in your left hand, and you can do several different functions. You can illuminate. So when you hook the scope in and put the button on and put the light on, the light, uh, the light guide uh, bring the light to the uh, distal end. And uh, if you look at it, where the light comes from, this is the light source connector where we put it to the processor. The light comes from this light guide. So the light comes from here and then it, trans it goes all the way and then comes out in the light port. Then another function is encephalation. When you go into the colon or you go into the esophagus, or the organs are collapsed and you need to put in air or CO2 to encephalate. And the air and CO2 is coming through this air water nozzle. This is a com combined nozzle that allows both air and water to come out. And in the control section, there is this air water button that is blue colored. And uh, how do you uh, get the air? Uh, so in order to get the air, you gently uh, occlude that air water button by putting your finger on top of that. And what happens is the air comes from this uh, air supply connector uh, that is hooked to a water bottle and it is pumped by the, uh, by the machine, the processor, through this uh, air pump. And as you can see here, when you occlude, air comes from here, goes up, and then comes down and insufflates uh, your uh, colon or stomach or whatever. And when you press it down, what happens is the blue button, when you press it down, then water comes out that uh, uh, clears the, uh, the lens. And sometimes you can use this small amount of water to go through difficult colonoscopy. So there is a Japanese investigator who came up with this concept of minimal water encephalation. You know, you just press it down and push the scope. And especially by doing that, you don't distend the colon and you're able to reach the cecum in difficult colonoscopy. And I try to use that same technique with minimal water encephalation. Then, so we talked about the water that comes out and the water comes out in a small channel by the side of the air connector. One is for air and the other one is for water. Then you, how do you suction? So suction goes through the biopsy channel and the way to do that is you press on the suction button that is the red button, and you press it down. And when you press it down, uh, the fluid actually goes through the suction uh, channel, and then it goes out through the suction connector here. So you need to know different uh, components of the scope so that when you have a problem, you can figure out how to fix the problem. Then you have the accessory port, and that's where your instruments go and accessory ports are of different sizes and you need to know the size of your accessory port. And when you put a biopsy port, it comes out through the biopsy channel or accessory port channel. And uh, this is what allows endoscopists to do different things. Accessory port uh, devices allow you to do all the therapy that you can think of that endoscopists have been able to do. Now, we'll talk about photography. I think if you think about one profession where somebody has a camera for the longest time in their hands, I believe it is the endoscopist. Not the movie guys, not anybody else. It is the endoscopist. Every day if you're doing scopes for six to eight hours, maybe two to three days a week, imagine the number of hours you have a camera in your hand. And uh, when you think about photography, you have to think about how to take beautiful photographs. Uh, my good friend Roy uh, taught me this. Make sure that when you see something, don't uh, uh, capture the photo. First thing is you freeze the photo. 
so that you are able to freeze and make that image still and you can watch what is happening and uh, make a decision and then capture the photo. So this concept of freezing, taking time to watch and then capturing is really critical. And you must get into the habit. And most of the current scopes have this ability to do electronic chroma endoscopy. This will help us differentiate from benign to cancer of our polyps. And this has been a major advance in the last uh, few years. In some cases, especially if you have an adult colonoscope, uh, uh, this is a function that is available uh, in, the, uh, in the Olympus uh, adult colonoscope where you can go nearer, near to the lesion and you're not sure is it a hyperplastic polyp or is it a adenoma and uh, the vessels are not seen well. Then I put my near focus and I was able to distinguish between the two. So you want to get into the habit of freezing and making a, a decision whether it's something that you need to worry about or not then capturing the image. And if you are not sure, using additional functions like uh, MDI or chroma endoscopy. Uh, for other companies, it's like a FIS or iScan. Uh, so there are different companies who use different chroma endoscopy functions. And then if you have a near focus function, uh, it will allow you to make better decisions. So we talked about photography. And then it comes to steering. How do you steer? the scope. The, there are control wheels, as you can see here, there are control wheels. These are the control wheels. And uh, they have a right, left, up, down. And when you turn the dial, uh, you either move it to the right or to the left. And then when you let it go, uh, it is like an electronic steering. It almost tries to straighten up. But if you want to maintain a right bend to the scope and keep it there, there are two things you can do. You can keep struggling with your thumb and trying to hold it, or you can use the lock and lock it uh, so that you have that fixed position. And using a lock is very important so that you avoid too much of strain on your joints and you avoid uh, getting injuries by uh, repeated mechanical movements. So something to keep in mind, if I'm trying to right, left or whatever, I think that I need to maintain that position, I use my lock. When you use your lock, think about unlocking before you go forwards, something to keep in mind. So when you turn right, left, the tip, actually this is the section that actually moves either right, left, up, down. So we talked about that insertion tube stiffening wire and how do you tighten that? And this is only available in colonoscopes. And, uh, uh, and I believe this is the, this, this insertion tube stiffness is uh, available in Olympus. And actually, if you want to know the story behind it, uh, Dr. Christopher Williams is one of the pioneers in colonoscopy. He is the author, co-author, co-editor of this, uh, what we call the Bible in endoscopy, for endoscopists, uh, Practical GI Endoscopy by Dr. Peter Cotton and Christopher Williams. Uh, Dr. Cotton did all the sections uh, while Dr. Williams did the colonoscopy part of the section. And he was, uh, uh, came up with this idea of how to stiffen the scope. And this helps you to talk, to limit the amount of uh, scope uh, uh, looping and able to get uh, further up. So when you tighten this, this uh, tube becomes, uh, the insertion tube becomes stiff. All right, so let's talk about different channels. So we talked about when you press the blue button, uh, air comes out and uh, let us trace how the air comes out. You have the air pump that pumps the air and you have a water bottle and that, that actually gets connected to the air supply connector. 
and maybe this water bottle could be connected to CO2 also. And uh, let us see how, uh, when you press this button, air water button, and once your uh, machine is on, CO2 insufflator is on, uh, let us look at how does the CO2 or air travels through the scope. So it comes from here, it goes up, and then comes down through the air water uh, channel. So that's the path uh, to keep that in mind, okay? And let us look at what happens when you press the blue button all the way down, uh, the water comes out. So you have the water here, water bottle, and you still need the pump to push things down. And uh, this is what happens. That is the path that water travels from the air water uh, channel or the lens cleaning uh, channel. Right, so that's where things are going to come out. So let us look at when you press the suction valve, the red button all the way down, how does the suction work? So you see that comes out, okay. So these are the paths that you want to keep in mind so that when you have a problem with suction, you know which uh, area should you be dealing with. And I've seen people, uh, when I say suction is problem, they're trying to work on this area. And this is not the area that is related to suction. So something to keep in mind. Then how does the water jet work? So you have a water jet and a pump, and the pump is connected to uh, this end of the scope, uh, the auxiliary water jet connector, and you have a foot pedal, and you press on the foot pedal, and the water comes out. So that's how the water uh, comes out. And this channel is separate from all the other channels. It doesn't, uh, it's nowhere connected to either this or this uh, button. So something to keep in mind. So I want to stop here and uh, open this uh, session for a discussion. And uh, I invited uh, 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 Yuki, uh, Mr. Yuki Nakajima. And uh, Yuki, maybe I want you to, you know, you have a lot of experience uh, with uh, scope uh, design, scope manufacturing, and with your engineering background. I would like you to share with us you know, how should a trainee or a technician take care of an endoscope? I believe an endoscope costs about the same as a luxury car. Uh, some say right, like great. For people you. who like Porsche, it is like a, a mini mm -hmm. Porsche. Yeah, can, I, um, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, good, good. Well, thank you so much. Um, yeah, I just wanted to um, to uh, uh, share my experiences. I'm I'm so honored to share my experiences, and thank you for Dr. Aju to um, provide me this kind of opportunity. So I think the um, you know the uh, take you know uh, take care of end endoscope is really important uh, from a lot of different aspects, and. Um, um, so uh, endoscope is like human beings or friends from everyone, from the hospital staff, doctors, from the patients. It's a, it's a living animal, I mean, like human beings, I'm, I'm sure. So the, the most important thing is that um, all, all staff, doctors, and, you know, fellows, nurses, and techs should be ready to use the instruments for, the, uh, uh, for right equipment to uh, to the to the your patients, and um, <clears throat> those are the you know ready to use the instrument for the is essential essential requirement in order to provide the safe and effective use of the equipment to the your patients. All right. So, but our question is how to do it, and uh, again there are a lot of uh, elements are involved. And uh, first of all, maintenance is really important. You know, the, um, 
uh, like uh, Dr. Raju said, endoscope is like um, is a car. Um, you know the so please think about in front of a patient the scope is not ready or anything is not ready then everything is messed up right so everyone cannot come and provide the best practice to the patient so how to take care unfortunately i cannot tell you exact thing because the how to maintain is the different equipment to equipment and uh, please follow the instruction manual from the manufacturer provided, or please get receive the proper training from the, from the old manufacturers. So, but um, I think the in this session I want to give you some more general, you know, uh, or more philosophical things how to maintain the endoscope. I repeat again, endoscope is your friends, is your tools, like your family, human beings, okay? And, and on top of that, or in beside of this, it's very expensive. Dr. Raju said, you know, let, I wouldn't say exact price because this is a different, totally different manufacturer to manufacturer, endoscope to endoscope, but uh, please imagine like middle class Mercedes. Okay, like C class, E class, maybe, you know, Porsche, as you said, Dr. Raju, for new equipment. So I think all of you, the endoscope is so close to you, right? So if you uh, open the drawer, there are 10, 20 endoscopes lined up. So it's very, very close object. But Im imagine if you open the garage, there are 10 pushes on your garage. Same thing, same thing. And, um, you know, the <clears throat> sometimes difficult for you to imagine because, <laughs> yes, um, because uh, if you are not participated in, you know, purchasing decisions or, you know, the uh, uh, um, approval for repair, it's really expensive. So the reason why it is very expensive, one, this is very pre precision instrument, like like a Swiss made high class watch. Okay, and one of the reasons is that because it's made of hand, it's all handmade. So uh, when I was at the uh, at a, at the, a manufacturing company, I sometimes took by uh, my clients. Uh, our clients to the endoscopic manufacturing facility. They supplied how they uh, they care of assembly processes. There is no automated because it's very difficult. They they try to do automation in order to down uh, you know lower the cost, but it's so difficult because everything is you know precise and it should be handmade. It's like an art. It's like a craft. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, um, therefore, I think please think about whenever you see or you take the endoscope, you know, please gently talk to him or her, good morning, and please uh, have, a, have a nice day today together. You know, it's really like a human being. Did I answer to your question, Dr. Raju? Yep. You know, the thing is, I'm glad that you, the way you describe is to treat a scope like your friend. Uh, it's a very important way of uh, uh, building a relationship with the scope because you need to have mm -hmm. that respect for the scope. And uh, I would like to, uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for sharing that information. It's very useful. And uh, uh, let me invite uh, my good friend, Roy, uh, to make a comment. Roy. Good morning. I think uh, Yukio had given us the uh, 
high, higher level thoughts about how to take care of the endoscope. I think um, on the more practical uh, part uh, for the beginning uh, trainees, uh, they need to understand that, uh, as you had mentioned, the tip is very important. Uh, but then the insertion tube uh, is also very important. The endoscope insertion could be easily uh, bent and uh, there is a natural curve to it. Uh, so uh, when you uh, carry it uh, from the hanging post, uh, you would, uh, and then uh, try to put in a bin, you would want to uh, make sure that it uh, conforms to the uh, natural curve. Uh, this way then uh, there is no part of it that is uh, uh, damaged. Uh, the other part is that uh, current endoscope still uh, uses a, a light uh, source uh, with uh, fibers that bring the light to the tip. Uh, so uh, there is that part at the uh, insertion part of the endoscope down here, uh, whereby, not the insertion, is where the, the endoscope attaches to the machine, uh, whereby that uh, the, part, the fiber could easily, uh, could easily be damaged. Uh, so you uh, make sure that you don't drop any part of that. Um, other than that, uh, you had mentioned uh, a lot about the, the different uh, buttons, uh, the function. Uh, it is uh, not natural for us to be operating all of our fingers. Uh, the endoscope and uh, what we have uh, recently found that is that uh, trainees actually can learn it uh, if they are given uh, uh, the endoscope with a simulator and within a very very short time uh, if they just practice on the uh, handling part of the control body uh, they can uh, easily master it. Uh, the current millennial trainees are uh, uh, seem to think that the control body is just like the control console of a Nintendo machine. And uh, once they get uh, that concept in their mindset, this is just another uh, controls, uh, console, they uh, could easily uh, um, master it. Uh, this is a very different concept than uh, what I used to uh, be trained whereby the concept before was that uh, you learn it uh, with time over months and uh, really uh, uh, that concept needs to be changed. Uh, thank you. All right, thank you, Roy. I, I have a couple of questions. Maybe Roy, you could help or Yuki could help. Uh, one question came from uh, my good friend, Harish, Harish Gagneja. Uh, he is in Austin. Uh, he is a, uh, one of the governors for ACG and also past president of TSGE. Uh, he wants you to comment on cymatocon in water. Roy, any thoughts? So uh, let me share before I put you on the spot here. Uh, uh, Harish, thank you for asking that question. Uh, there are articles where people, as you know, that cymatocon can stick to the channel and uh, uh, the companies do say that don't use cymatocon, but we don't have any alternative when you have so many bubbles. But uh, at the same time, I heard that you could use uh, the minimum amount of cymatocon. And when I say minimum amount, you may ask me, what is that minimum amount? Uh, I don't know. But uh, let me ask uh, Laura, uh, who is one of our senior technicians. Uh, Laura, uh, if you can uh, uh, share what you know. Laura Romero, who is one of our chief technicians at MD Anderson Cancer Center. Hi, Dr. Raju. Um, well, according to Olympus, we should not use Cymeticon uh, in the water bottle. You can use Cymeticon, but you have to push it through the ch uh, biopsy channel. And I guess they only recommend maybe like one drop to two drops, it will be enough. Um, but um, the cymeticon shoe will never um, put it into the water that is attached to the scope. The reason why is because we are not, 
whenever we're cleaning the scope, we cannot go through that channel because the channel is very small. So you have to use the um, biopsy channel port, which is more accessible for us and we can pass the brush and we are able to remove. I mean, unfortunately you cannot be removed. You cannot remove 100% the Sametikon, but at least it will be, you will be passing the brush and you can remove a little bit, you know, but you should not attach it to the scope, only through the biopsy port. So uh, Laura, when you say through the biopsy port, uh, can you repeat the dilution? You put one or two drops for 60 ml or one or two drops in a basin or whatever? So we normally use the 500 cc emesin basin uh -huh. and we can just like two drops on that emesin basin. So that would be like two drops to 500 cc of water. All right. Is that what we are doing? That is correct. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you. Yes. I'm assuming. And, and I want to invite uh, uh, Mohit. Uh, now let me see if I can un unmute you, Mohit. You may, I want you to make the comment so that people can hear from you. Good morning, Dr. Raju. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for this lecture series. I wanted to make a comment that, you know, it is very important for the trainees, especially early on in their uh, training course, uh, to uh, remain very enthusiastic even when they lose the scope to their attendings, especially in the difficult cases, because that's an opportunity for them to just switch places and come over and work as a technician. And that gives immense education uh, from a control aspect of the scope, from the accessory aspect of the scope, which is again, very important to learn the anatomy of the endoscope in general. And secondly, just to echo what you said in your last lecture last week, spend some time in the scope reprocessing area and learn about the scope anatomy, learn from the technicians how they handle the scope, because that is what you're gonna translate into your endoscopy area, learn how to clean and disinfect the scope and handle the scope well. Thank you, Mohit. Thank you so much uh, for those comments. I really appreciate it. Thank you. And I want to take... Dr. Raju, uh, go ahead. Dr. Raju can I say something else? The reason why uh, Olympus said that we should not, that they do not support, uh, they do not recommend the use of Cymeticon with the Olympus scopes is because uh, the Cymeticon is uh, insoluble in both water and alcohol. And in addition, solutions containing Cymeticon, such as the infant gas drops, typically contain sugar, thickeners and uh, binding agents. Those ingredients will potentially support microbial and biofilm growth and may be difficult to remove during reprocessing. That's one of the reasons why Olympus doesn't um, recommend the Cymeticon. Right. Thank you, thank you so much, thank you. You're welcome. So one of the things that uh, for the sake of trainees, I want them to think about is the scopes that we have they are they are very very costly you know you're looking at uh, you know forty fifty thousand dollars per scope uh, a brand new scope and then it goes up uh, if it is in a us scope or an ercp scope with all the special functions the scope cost can go up so if you look at a typical uh, endoscopy unit storage area and uh, there is probably gold there in terms of the money that is there in that uh, storage area in terms of the number of the scopes. So you have different scopes. Uh, the workhorse is a single channel gastroscope. And you can see there are two channels here. That's a double channel uh, gastroscope. And in the coronoscopes, depending upon the manufacturer, uh, most of them have adult pediatric and some of them make it even smaller uh, compared to an adult scope, that is the slim scope. And uh, uh, these scopes will be useful depending upon the type of patient you're dealing with. And, uh, and then you have much longer scopes, as you can see here, this is so long that you have to actually curve it. Uh, this is an enteroscope. And then you also have uh, ERCP scope, uh, for ERCPs and uh, and uh, ultrasound scope uh, that we could uh, talk about. So let's talk about a few things. What is it that's important when you're doing a scope? Because you have so many choices to make. 
there are a few things that you want to keep in mind. What is the working length of a particular scope? And what is the working length? As you can see here, this is the working length of the scope. And that's where from here to here is where you can actually go in. But to be honest with you, you should be able to get the job done about uh, three quarters of the way. You don't have to put all the way in. And let us look at the working length of different scopes. You have the gastroscopes. Most of them are between 103 to 110 centimeters. And coronoscopes between 130 to 168 centimeters. And the endoscopes are much longer, about 200 centimeters. And the ERCP scopes and then the US scopes because most of them are done in the duodenum, so they're not that long, but about this length of a gastroscope. And uh, next is, what is the insertion tube diameter? And that is very important depending upon what you are doing. You know, that diameter will uh, help you uh, in certain cases. You know, if you're going into a very narrow area or a patient with stricture, you want to get a smaller caliber. If you're going to a colonoscope and somebody with a redundant colon, you may want to have an adult scope. So this diameter is very important to keep in mind. And let us look at the insertion tube diameter. For gastroscopes, the smallest is as small as five millimeters. And the biggest one is probably about uh, uh, nine to 10 uh, millimeters. Uh, double channel therapeutic scope is much bigger. Uh, most of the workhouse uh, scopes are about uh, uh, nine to 10 millimeters, while therapeutic scope two channel has a bigger diameter. When it comes to coronoscopes, uh, you need to keep in mind adult scope is about 12.8. And now the slim scope is about the same size as your gastroscope. And this is very useful, especially in a cancer center. You know, the other day we had a patient who came from uh, uh, north, of, uh, north side of Texas. Uh, she had endometrial cancer and she had a failed colonoscopy, but the oncologist wants to make sure that the colon is okay before he could put her on some additional therapy. And uh, I tried with a pediatric scope because she had a hysterectomy. Uh, no, no point in going with an adult scope, but even this, I failed. So then I went with the 9.5 millimeter scope. And it's interesting, I want to share with you, when I went with the 9.4 centimeter scope, I didn't use the water jet uh, function. Uh, I'll talk about the water jet in a, in a slim scope. But what I used is uh, press my wa air water button down and let that small amount of water to open the channel to go in. This is something you may want to keep in mind when you go through a very difficult, technically challenging, angulated, fixed uh, sigmoid colon. And then the introscopes are again uh, smaller, as you can see, introscope, slim colonoscope, and the EGD scope are about the same size, few millimeters here and there, and then ERCP scope, and finally, the US scope. So if your adult scope doesn't go through a stricture, there's no point in trying to push your US scope, which is much bigger, and you may end up with a perforation. So something to keep in mind. And if you're planning to uh, put a NASA jejunal feeding tube, uh, picking uh, this scope, uh, the smallest gastroscope, and you go through the nose, uh, and then you go down into the jejunum and pass a wire, and you can put a feeding tube nicely. The next thing Dr. is you want to think about what is the channel diameter. As you can see, this is very important concept to keep in mind because instruments come in a particular diameter, right? And you need to know the biopsy channel size. So, most uh, workhouse scopes have a good channel size that allows you to pass almost all instruments. But when you're using a very small channel size uh, scope, you need to think about what devices can go through that. Sometimes you start a scope and then you find yourself 
struggling through that uh, channel, putting a device in, and you may not be able to be successful and you will get frustrated. So important to keep uh, the channel diameter. And it's also, I want to keep in, share one thing. There is a gastroscope that has six millimeter channel. And uh, uh, Roy used to have it in his uh, unit. I always had the envy about uh, uh, Roy having that scope because this six millimeter channel scope is great if you have a bleeding ulcer and you want to clear the clots or whatever, this will be very helpful. Uh, it took me almost 20 years to have a six millimeter channel scope uh, uh, at my unit. Uh, then, uh, as you can think about, endoscopes have smaller channels and ERCP scope has a bigger channel and this is how you can actually put uh, most of these stents because stents are bigger. Uh, a 3.7 millimeter uh, adult scope or 3.2, uh, these are the sizes you have to keep in mind to actually uh, figure out what type of therapy you're going to do and what type of device you need uh, that can go through that. And finally, what is the field of view? You want to keep that thing in mind because field of view is different for different scopes. And as you can see here, the field of view for a gastroscope is 120 to 140 degrees. And colonoscope has much better field of view. That's why you're able to screen the colon. And uh, the engineers have purposefully built that additional field of view because the colon has a bigger caliber. So you need to have a bigger uh, field of view. And uh, uh, that is uh, important to keep in mind. And finally, you have to think about the bending section of your uh, scope. You know, whether you can bend right, left, up, down, and how much is the bending section. If you have a very difficult case, you need to pick, when I say difficult case, a case where the colon or the gut has taken multiple bends, you need to have a scope that is almost like a noodle that can bend in different directions very well. So let us look at the bending sections. So gastroscope, you know, up, down, right, left. So one thing is you keep in mind is up bending is maximum for every scope. So say for example, you're going in and the, and the bend is to the left and up. So instead of just turning your left, you want to rotate your scope so that the left becomes up, and then you uh, bend, uh, push the up, down, up to make the best use of that uh, two, 210 degree uh, function. Every time you pick a scope from the storage area, it is a good idea to actually check your up, down function and make sure the uh, scope is able to bend all the way 210 degrees. And if the scope is not bending 210 degrees, it's 180 degrees. If it is not bending what it, it should, that scope should actually go to the repair and get that uh, wire tightened or whatever, because it will limit your ability to actually do what you want to do and you'll be struggling. And that bending section, if it doesn't bend and you go through that uh, difficult area, you are likely to perforate. So you want to make sure that the bending section really works well and you have to keep that thing in mind. The other thing is if you also look at it, colonoscopes, the upward bend is 180 degrees. It's not 210. And uh, it is something to keep in mind. But on the other hand, colonoscope can bend up, down, right, left, combined much better than a gastroscope because that's the way the colon is structured. Microscope has the same thing, and the ERCP scope probably it doesn't really matter that much because there's not uh, technically that uh, much of a stress on the bending section. So I want to uh, share with you, for the sake of fellows, when you take up a scope, you think about you know how is this scope different from other scopes. It's probably not a bad idea for you to go to your storage area, take a measuring tape 
and measure the insertion tubes of different scopes, measure the diameter of the scope, and measure the uh, channel of the scope, and also figure out the bending section bending, because it is worthwhile doing this exercise, and uh, you will be surprised how well uh, you will be uh, prepared for doing this, uh, your procedure. You want to know everything about the scope that is in your hands to do a good procedure. And I want to stop here. Uh, and uh, if there are any questions, I will actually be happy to answer. And maybe my panelists will be happy to answer. So I want to maybe unmute. Uh, uh, Do I have a question? Uh, Liza, I'm ready to ask the question, please. Uh, here is the question. Maybe you or one of the engineers can answer. On the blue button, on the top button, even if I'm not pressing it, is there a baseline suction? And if there is, what millimeter, you know, mercury or what, how do you measure that pressure? All right, Yuki, can you answer that? Let, let me confirm your question. How the suction, you know, pressure is designated? Is that questions? No, That's one question? of the questions. Yeah. Go ahead, go ahead, Naza. Yeah. yeah, the first. So let me uh, repeat the question. So what Nizam is uh, asking is, once you put the suction on, once you hook the scope to a suction, is there like a low level suction uh, continuously on the scope? And if no, it is, no, what is I the don't amount? Think so. You know, in other words, he's asking, I, I okay, once you put your car in the reverse gear, you know, it, it moves on, whether you put your pedal or not, right? It's the same thing. Correct. But I think you have um, the, you can, you, you can actually more, uh, uh, decrease your suction on, your, uh, on the wall because you have an option for continuous suction and then intermittent. So you can just change the level of your suction. Yeah. So the question that I think if I understand right, uh, Nizam is asking is whether you put low suction, medium suction or high suction, whether there is a low grade ongoing suction when you don't press the red button. Is that right? Exactly. Right. 100%. Right. I don't think so. I don't think there is something. I don't like think it. so. It doesn't make sense from clinical perspective All right. and from safety perspective. And same for air insufflation. If you do not touch any button, the any plus pleasures. I mean, air, in, we, we're not giving in to the, uh, to the patient. If that is the case, I think you should send the instrument to the repair. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Well. So, uh, one second, I'm going to go through this chat and... Uh, um, <clears throat> they're asking about uh, if it's possible doing suction while Doing clipping, if yes, which clips can you suction with? So the right thing is, actually the most important thing is uh, to keep in mind this concept, that is, what is the size of the suction channel of your scope, and what is the size of the instrument that is going through, right? Uh, if you put a, you know, uh, for the question, the answer is yes, if you are using an adult or a pediatric colonoscope or an adult gastroscope, the answer is yes. But the amount of suction you can have uh, depends upon the space that is left between your, uh, the channel wall and the instrument that is inside the channel. So that's what it is. Uh, and uh, uh, Mohit, uh, You want to comment on that? Uh, Jude, sure. I think uh, 
Go ahead. Mahit, go ahead. Uh, Dr. Raju, Dr. Raju rightly said, uh, you know, the maximum tip, tip reflection on majority of colonoscopes is about 180 degrees. But, but please, uh, you know, uh, it's important for fellows to be aware what exactly uh, lies in their, uh, you know, endoscope storage area. If you are on Pentax system at your uh, hospital, uh, look for a retro view scope, which has a 210 degree uh, tip deflection rather than 180 degree, which makes maneuvering through fixed or tortuous segments, especially in uh, post-surgical bellies, much easier than the standard adult or a pediatric colon scopes. So utilize if your, your endoscopy area already carries one. Oh, that's good. Thank you for the comment. Right. Dr. Ra uh, there's another question. They ask in, sometimes I see endoscopies leave the insertion tube and maneuver the direction with both wheels. When should we do that? Can you comment on that, please? So I, th I think uh, one thing is uh, I want to, I think this is a comment from Ahmad. Uh, Amma, this, this is the way I would like to share with you. When you are doing your endoscopy, think about your endoscope as an extension of your body. You know, is an extension of your hand or whatever it is. You know, it's part of your part of it is an extension of you. And when you want to do rotation or drive the scope, you have to think that you could do different moves by thinking about, okay, I have the core of my body, I can move right or left, and if I'm holding my scope and my scope is relatively straight with no loop, I can actually, uh, this movement would uh, let it get transmitted to the end. So that's one. The second one is you could actually move your shoulder and you could like a baton. You can also do that. Third one is you can also move the wrist and also uh, rotate the tip. And the fourth one, after I've done all this, then I'm actually going to try to use my right, left, up, down, or with my thumb. And that is the last maneuver that I do. Uh, that's the last step that I try to take when I want to move. The key in endoscopy is this, keep your scope straight. Uh, how do you keep your scope straight? Take few steps away from the patient and the scope straightens up. The scope becomes, the scope becomes straight. When you're close to the patient, the scope actually goes down and then takes a U shape and then comes up. Whatever movements you do, when you're very close to the patient, you lose uh, that movement in that loop that goes down. It doesn't go to the tip. So get into the habit of taking few steps away and have your scope straight. And if you have that, you actually will enjoy doing your endoscopy without having to use your right hand to talk. And you can get most of the stuff by little movements of your body. So uh, I hope uh, this answer helps you. Can I can I provide a one, another comment yes. on top of you, Dr. Raju? Yes, I fully agree that the tip of the endoscope is your extension of your eyes, your you know your fingers, and um, therefore the uh, bending section. Someone already mentioned a uh, bending section is very important portion. To be honest with you, um, assembly process. Let's say 100%. You know, 100 hours or 40 hours. I don't know how much, how how long. But you know they are taking care of very amount of time to assemble the you know bending section. It's uh, really handmade, and there are a lot of process to take care of how the, you know the bending uh, is important. So this describes you know the bending section is very important, just for my experience. Oh, thank you, thank you. Uh, there's a comment from Harish. I really appreciate that, uh, Harish. I think that uh, uh, Slim Scope, uh, you know, yeah, our unit has Olympus. So we do have the Slim Scope, and it is, a, I agree with you, it's extremely useful, uh, especially when you have a very difficult colon. 
either with severe diverticulosis or hairpin sigmoid, like you commented. I agree with you. All right. I just want to uh, conclude the session if there are no questions. And I want to thank uh, uh, Laura. And uh, thank you, Laura, for joining. And I want to thank uh, Roy, my good friend. And I want to thank uh, Yuki for joining. And uh, I want to thank uh, Zubair. And uh, lastly, Selvi. I uh, really appreciate uh, everybody's support. And uh, we'll keep doing these things. And we want to make sure that we help our uh, trainees and we help our technicians and nurses uh, so that we all can provide better care for our patients. And hope you all have a great uh, Sunday. Thank you. Be safe. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, that's Raju and everybody.